Hi, I'm Dr. Johnson Haas, and welcome to Earth Parts. It's only a theory. It's only a hunch. This is one that addresses more a miscommunication between the cultures of society and the cultures of science. Because you or I, normally in conversation with somebody in casual discourse, would not use the technical language so much. And we might use the word theory like it's only a theory. Oh, I got a theory about that. Oh, yeah, that's, you know what my theory is? Stuff like that. But actually, in science, that's not what we're saying when we say theory. And this, people get hung up on this. They talk about the theory of evolution saying, well, it's only a theory, without understanding what the word means, what the word theory actually connotes. When people use that term, it's only a theory, what they're really saying in real plain language is that they're proposing a hypothesis. They're proposing an idea that may or may not be true, and they don't know, but they have their own take on it. Your hypothesis is used in science all the time, but it applies to everything where a decision is being made. A hypothesis is a testable or a disprovable inference or assertion, basically a testable claim. It's an idea that can be tested and possibly disproved if it's wrong. That's what a hypothesis is. And the common language of theory in normal use out there in the world is very close to this term, actually, hypothesis is the meaning of it. Now, that's very different from what a theory is in science. A scientific theory is a very specific thing. It is, and I'll go through this bit by bit, but I'm going to give you a, a nice definition that I like. It's a, it's a model. A theory is a model based on verifiable hypotheses shown to be consistent with available data and observations and accepted as an explanation for some natural process. It's not a hunch. It's not a guess. It's not even an educated guess. A theory is the best that a scientific concept can achieve in terms of usefulness, reliability, and respect. Being able to use it. Show that it's true over and over and over again. Let me take that definition apart a little bit. A model based on verifiable hypotheses. That means a hypothesis has been formulated. Someone has come up with a hypothesis. And that involves trying to model or abstract or get to the bottom of the gist of a problem. And a model seeks to develop a comprehensive understanding of what the hypothesis is and what it should predict you to find when you do experiments to test it. So it's a model based on verifiable hypotheses shown to be consistent with available data and observations. It has been shown already to be consistent with available data and observations. People, tens, maybe hundreds, if not more, people who work their careers away year after year in painstaking work, taking it seriously, collect the data. They collect the observations. They do the hard work. And all that information that, that is verifiable, that makes sense, that you can test, that you can repeat, you can check all that information, once it's available, once all the hard work has been done, maybe the decades of hard work by people across the world who are often in direct competition with each other trying to get there first, all that information is put together and it points, all the arrows point to that this idea is right, it works, and then shown to be consistent with available data and observations, it is then accepted as an explanation for some natural process. It's accepted. A theory is not a hunch or a guess. A scientific theory is one that has graduated. It has gone through the fire of being tested and argued about and money and blood being spent on that discovery. And the result is we now know something we didn't and we know it pretty well. That's a theory. Theories help us to explain the observations we already have. The heliocentric theory that the sun is the center of the solar system is called that, the heliocentric theory, because we know that the sun is at the center of the solar system pretty well. The germ theory of disease, that diseases are caused by infectious microbes, viruses, bacteria. There's also genetic diseases, but this term is applied specifically to infectious disease passed on by microbes. We call it the germ theory of disease. 
the theory of gravity, because it's been shown to be true over and over again to the point that rejecting it becomes absurd and perverse. The theory of gravity, it is called that. It is a theory. And it got us all the way across the solar system on time. The theory of biological evolution, that life has evolved over the eons. We know this really, really well. We know this from fossils. We know this from geology. We know this from genetics. If we had no fossils at all, the genetic record alone would demonstrate the absolute reality of biological evolution. It is graduated long ago to an accepted scientific fact. The theory with which allows us to understand it. As others have said before me, nothing in biology makes sense without evolution. This is a cultural controversy in the United States, but not in most of the rest of the world, so that's why I have to even talk like this. But this is known. It's a fact. It really is real. So theory means something you can put some fair bit of trust in because it stood the test of time. This is about trying to cultivate the skill to be a skeptical thinker. And it's not easy. It's hard work. It requires effort. It requires a person to think a bit more consciously and to analyze arguments with a bit more effort than is normal. And so often people will not do that when they might benefit from having done so. Science is about being rational and about thinking skeptically. And that's a word that has a number of connotations in English, at least in the U.S. Skeptical is often considered to mean being cynical, being a contrarian or just stubbornly refusing to accept anything that doesn't already fit with what you believe. That's not what skeptical thinking is about. Skeptical thinking is supposed to be about rational thinking, free of bias, being able to accept the implications of hard evidence, even against your own personal preference, trying to understand reality, and trying to accept as many true things as possible and reject as many false things as possible. And so it's not about being a contrarian or about being angry at anyone else. It's simply about saying, okay, give me the evidence. Show me the, the, the data that supports your claim. Show me your proof, if you have proof. And that's why science becomes so valuable. The scientific method, not the profession of scientists in lab coats, but the method of approaching a problem with the ability to accept being wrong and to say, how can I be more confident in this belief or this claim I'm making? How can I be more confident? Can I test it? And being able to say to yourself when you test something and find that it's not real, to just give it up and go on. That's hard. That can be hard in many walks of life, but it's a bar you should try to meet if you want to be able to think critically and have your internal map of the world actually map onto the real world. Carl Sagan said it best with a few words, extraordinary claims demand extraordinary evidence. If you want to claim to me that there is a face on Mars and it was carved there by Martians, you have to then demonstrate to me that there is evidence that Mars used to support a big active biosphere with a civilization of beings that evolved there. You need to show me ruins, show me some evidence, show me something beyond a mesa that kind of looks sort of like a person's face when you look at it from the right angle at the right time of day. Extraordinary evidence is required for an extraordinary claim like an ancient Martian civilization. Don't be gullible is basically the goal of skeptical thinking. Don't be taken for a ride. Don't be a victim. Because in science, you're trying to unearth reality step by step. But critical thinking applies to any kind of claim situation. Anytime somebody's making a factual claim, when advertisements try to convince you to buy their product, when political parties try to convince you to vote for them, don't be played. And the tools of science can be applied in any walk of life productively. And it's hard work sometimes, but it generally pays off. There are a number of rules of thumb you can apply to help you be able to be a better critical thinker, or a better scientist for that matter, is a claim supported in a good way. For example, if someone's making a claim, are their data, are their findings, their conclusions independently confirmed by someone else? Are they making a claim by themselves, or have others tested to make sure they're right? Others meaning, mostly in science, competitors. 
other labs who would love to get to good data first. Testing by multiple people that are not already favored to accept a claim is one way science goes about its business of checking to make sure you're right or wrong. I might be wrong about something, but if someone checks it, they might, be, they might show me that I'm wrong. That's important. That's how science works. You also want to repeat. Repetition of an experiment. If you can do it once, make sure you can do it again. Make sure it's something you can do whenever you set up the experiment the same way again and again. Encourage vigorous debate of available evidence by qualified experts in the topic. Is debate encouraged or do the proponents of the claim not want it to be discussed? Want to keep it secret? Won't tell you how it works? And there's proprietary and there's business and that's fine, but if someone's making a claim of a perpetual motion machine, a free energy device, they need to be able to show that it works. Actually provide evidence, let somebody test it without seeing the plans, but really test it. Make rules, you can't open it or whatever, but there needs to be some way you can test to make sure this is real. Only, and this is a hard thing to say culturally, but it really is the case that only qualified experts have a trustworthy voice. If I want to know what the best procedures are for conducting heart surgery, I'm going to ask a heart surgeon or an expert in heart surgery and not an auto mechanic who may be an expert, world-class master at taking a car apart and putting it back together again, a thing I cannot do, but they don't know heart surgery. People can have their opinions. Everybody can have their opinions. That's the freedom of mind, but you're not entitled to your own facts. We share a universe where there are objective facts that can be measured. That's the point of science. I make a measurement and I really think it's right, but if others show me that I'm wrong, I need to be able to accept that. I need to be able to deal with it as a grown up. Avoid arguments from authority. And this is a subtle one and a tough one to discuss because you rely upon experts, but there's a difference between expert and authority. For example, if I were to try to tell you how evolution works or how climate operates, what I should do is lay out all the stuff for you from basic start to finish, all the steps in plain view, where I got my information, why it's reliable. That's what an expert does. An expert pulls the argument apart like a master mechanic would take a car apart piece by piece and see if every part still works or which ones need to be replaced. That's very different from what an authority would do. An authority is the concept that because it says so in an ancient book, or because a national leader says so, then I should believe and obey. If someone says I'm right because I, am, I have a knighthood from the queen and a bunch of impressive medals, that's why I'm right. No, that is an argument from authority. If someone claims they're right because of who they are and how great they are, that's not convincing. If they claim they're correct, but they can provide evidence, a sound argument, logic, then the expertise of that voice is worth listening to.